What is up gearheads? Happy, happy new year. Welcome to my first video of the year and which is of some importance for me, at least gear wise. So last month I bid farewell to my Nikon system, sold off my cameras, my lenses, my accessories, everything. So you read that right. I am bidding farewell to my Nikon rig. And in this video, I'll explain why. So like, subscribe and hit that notification bell and then let's get to it. Right, so before anything else, I'd like to give a quick tribute to Nikon by showing you some of the highlights from my use of the system. I started out with the Nikon D800 in 2015. Because of my background as a diver, underwater photography was my entry point to the world of photography. I received most of my photography awards on the back of this incredible camera. Sharks, turtles, and mantas were some of my main subjects. It also accompanied me as I expanded into portraiture and beyond. The D800 helped me define my style and career as a photographer. In 2018, I switched up to the D850. I was a lot more technically proficient by this point and it showed in my work. My photos with this camera has garnered international acclaim and exposure both below and above water. Its video features at that time weren't groundbreaking but were still suited for what I needed. I firmly believe that the Nikon D850 was the finest and best DSLR camera ever made, hands down. Moving on, the Nikon Z7 and the Nikon Z6 replaced my D850 in my arsenal in 2019. I wanted something lighter and that can do better video. They were clearly not the best in class in mirrorless, but I was very happy with both cameras. At the time, I was also made a Nikon ambassador for the Z series and everything just came together. My switch into the Nikon Z system coincided with my venture into content creation, including this channel and this show. So the Nikon Z7 became my A camera and the Z6 was my B camera. For all intents and purposes, everything was good. Now, it's no mystery as to why I'm switching out of my Nikon system. I need better video features, period. And it's quite ironic if you think about it, because before I was a photographer, I was a TV commercial director. But after 15 years, I decided to switch out of it because I was burnt out and stick to photography exclusively. And for me, Nikon was the best in wildlife photography. So the irony is the fact that now that I'm doing more video content, I need a camera that has more advanced and intuitive video features. So what do I need? I need a system that allows me to shoot both photo and video professionally and switch between modes seamlessly. I'll be using it for wildlife and documentary photography and also for the documentary filmmaking in the same genre. Now, aside from the obvious, which is image quality, I also need advanced autofocus, 8K and log recording, weather sealing, portability in the field, and with exceptional color science. So I know it sounds vague in general, but it's actually quite nuanced and specific when you consider what I do. Based on my needs, and they are quite extensive, I have narrowed down my options to two brands, Canon and Sony, specifically Canon R5C and the Sony A1. Both cameras has accommodated my requirements down pat. There's actually an overlap, but as with any comparison, each one brings its own strengths and weaknesses to the table. Now, I understand this is the paradox of choosing cameras and it's just the reality of it. And it all boils down really to what we need at the moment and our decisions are based on the information that we have at that time. So let's compare. The R5C is the result of Canon's push to further strengthen the video capabilities of the R5 model. The R5 itself is already a terrific stills camera and the R5C brings forth video features normally found on Canon's cinema line. And as you can see, it is in fact that, a cinema camera. So simply put, the R5C is a combination of the R5, which is already an incredible stills camera, and the addition of cinema line features. So it's exactly what I need as a hybrid storyteller. But let's dig in deeper. Now, the number one thing that I love about Canon is the color science. Skin tones and footage and photos shot on Canon are just lovely out of the box. Dual pixel autofocus is also a big draw. 
fast, accurate autofocus is absolutely essential in wildlife. And honestly, I have been salivating over the Dual Pixel AF for a few years now as a Nikon user. Next, Canon Glass is also top notch. I've tried the new RF lenses and they are a joy to use. More to the point, it's great that I can use them with a Red Komodo system, which I plan to get in the future. Now, this may be something that is specific to underwater photography or maybe even more specific to me in terms of my style as an underwater photography, but the fact that there is an 8 to 15 millimeter fish eye native to Canon, that is a big, big plus to the brand. I normally shoot with a fish eye lens underwater, and when I was using Nikon, I had the Nikkor 8 to 15 fish eye. You can actually check my review of that incredible lens right here. I won't get into the reasons why, but basically fisheye is really suited for underwater photography. There are also rumors that there'll be an RF version of the 8 to 15 millimeter fisheye. And when that happens, that's it, I'm sold. And also on a personal note, I have a good relationship with the people at Canon Philippines. So that's also a big plus. It speaks volumes when it comes to needing support. Going the R5C route has a major impact on my system costs as a whole. Because it's a cinema camera, the corresponding underwater housing is considerably more expensive. I've been using Nauticam housing since 2016, and as you can see here, the housing for an R5 is $4,832, while for an R5C, it's a whopping $6,677. This is mainly because of the cinema camera specific ergonomics, design, and features such as bigger zoom and focus knobs, and the provision to add the sled. Now I can take a different route and go for the R5 instead, but I'm concerned about the overheating issues. I could wait for the R5 II since the R6 II just came out, but we don't know when that's gonna be released. Now another thing about Canon is that their lenses have external zoom movement. And you know, that's, that's a bane in the field because all the dirt and dust will definitely go in. Now the A1 is Sony's flagship, or is that the A9 II? I'm confused. Anyway, it's one of Sony's top cameras and the features when I saw them just blew my mind. It really pushes the boundaries of what features can get packed into such a small form factor. A good friend has been singing praises for the A1 for both underwater and top side work and to some extent, I have to agree. The first thing that the A1 has going for it is the size. It's perfect for field work. And I specifically like the fact that most of the Sony cameras share the same generic general design, specifically for the A1 that it's interchangeable with the A7S III. So for underwater photography, you have specific housings for specific camera models. And for my Nikon Z7, I could interchange it with my Z6, so that was that was really cool. With the Sony A1, I can interchange it with the Sony A7S III, so that's really cool. And this matters because that means that I don't have to have different housings for different cameras. Imagine if this was Canon. So I will have, let's say, an R5. Uh, you have a housing for that. And let's say my other camera, my camera B is an R6. So it's going to be a different camera housing. It's just not practical. As you know, when you're out on professional work, it's always good to have two camera bodies, you know, just in case something happens for underwater, in case it floods. Um, so having an A1 and then an A7S III as a backup camera and being able to use both in one housing, that's insanely good. Of course, this can easily be solved by getting the same model of camera, so two A1s. But also that's impractical because it's so expensive. I've also heard so much about the new lenses such as the 24 to 70 GM2 and the 7200 GM2. So maybe this is a good time for me to actually switch to the system. Now this may not be a camera specific strength, but I also have to consider the team's ecosystem. So my staff, my crew, my camera operators, underwater DOPs and topside DOPs all use Sony. So it's much better when you're out in the field if you have the same system. So let's say swapping batteries or lenses and also in post, it's much easier to match footage. 
And one last thing, Sony's autofocus is absolutely magical, especially with the A1. In fact, in some cases, it has already surpassed Canon's dual pixel autofocus. That said, my biggest gripe about Sony is the color science. I've said this over and over again and again that there was time that I used Sony, the A7R2, and I really hated the color science. I felt like it, it was inaccurate and impressive, very bland, and in fact, I use the term very, very clinical. Now, I have heard that it has improved significantly, but I just can't get that taste out of my mouth. Some of you might say that, hey, you could just you know edit in post or drop in a lot. Sure, but for me, that's not how I work. If you have seen my Watch Me Work live episodes where I do photo editing uh, live, it, it's not how I work. I, I normally just take 15 minutes when I'm editing, and this is really a testament to not just me as a photographer, but really of the Nikon system. The colors of Nikon were just absolutely impressive. Now, Sony, well, we'll have to see. Now, does this switch mean that I'm never touching another Nikon camera? Absolutely not. Aside from the obvious, which is reviewing Nikon cameras and lenses, that's actually how I got started here with Hammerhead Gearhead, there is a specific role that Nikon plays in my life, and that is for personal use. As a huge fan of the Nikon FM2 camera, I'm longing to get my hands on the black-on-black -black Nikon ZFC, which has an intentional striking resemblance to the Nikon FM2. Add this beautiful Shoten ZF1 F to Z adapter that has the same analog aesthetic, and bam, you're done. That's the perfect travel setup for me. A Nikon FM2 to shoot film with, and then a Nikon ZFC Black on Black with that Shoten adapter to shoot digital. And I can use my manual focus film lenses across both cameras. I'd also like to add that I regard the Nikon Z9 as the best stills camera, mirrorless camera for wildlife photography. So I'm still hoping to get my hands on that if I'm ever so blessed <laughs> in the future. Now, I know I said a lot of things and it goes without saying that all of these opinions are mine and mine alone. I do need your help though. Please make yourself heard in the comments. I want to hear your thoughts and your responses to everything I've said. I need them. I need the help. I'm planning to make that switch next month. That's February of 2023. If you're wondering which system I'm leaning towards, let's just say I'm using the Can R5 right now, which was graciously lent to me by Canon Philippines but you know nothing is set in stone i'm you know still on the fence about it so that's it please like subscribe and hit that notification bell follow my two instagram accounts noel guevara photo for wildlife and conservation and the roadworthy man for film and digital lifestyle street travel portraits so that's it thanks for listening cheers and i'll see you soon